Hello and welcome to Work at Life Season 3. Um, I'm Maddie Grant and I'm here with my good friend Sonia Lucina. And man, we have a great topic for today. I'm super excited. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to ask our special guest, um, Colleen Scott, to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what you do, because I think that'll just introduce the topic right sure. there. <laughs> um, my name is Colleen Scott. I was trained as an architect, but I work as a project management specialist. Uh, we help tenants from when they are trying to make adjustments to their office, just getting ideas started through to finishing the project. We manage design and construction uh, and furniture and all of the other vendors to execute their plans. Yeah, so we wanted to talk to Colleen today because of course in our, you know, our theme for this season is the great opportunity mm -hmm. which is related to the the workforce kind of, you know, putting their foot down and saying we don't necessarily want to work the way you want us to work. <laughs> now that we know that we can get our jobs done from home and, you know, and maybe we have different needs for returning to the office. So here in the U.S., Labor Day was in September, and it was kind of a milestone for lots of companies and organizations thinking about bringing staff at least partially back to the office. But then came the Delta variant and more COVID-related changes and, and risks and worries. So this whole idea of what do we do to bring our people back, you know, is still is a, a big issue right now. Um, and I think when I talked to Colleen about this uh, recently, there she had some great examples of some of the changes that she's seen um, in what employers are doing to try and attract people back. So maybe you could share a couple of those. Sure. Um, well, I think the question has been, what are we planning for? Are we planning for right now? Are we planning for the future? And what does the future look like? I think we saw a lot of people under similar deadlines for Labor Day, and that sort of came and quietly disappeared as a, <laughs> as a topic. Um, but we've seen a lot of people make adjustments with furniture, which is an easy way to change things um, inside a space. And Overall, what we've been seeing more of is that people are doing a lot of their quiet heads down work at home and they're really coming to the office for that sense of community and camaraderie that they that they missed so much. So what does that space look like? It, it's not um, a sea of desks anymore. It's collaborative yeah. spaces uh, and a variety of different spaces to appeal to different types of people, uh, different ways that people work. Um, I was working, I'm working on a school project and we had a conversation about some kids sit at desks, some kids like to sit on the floor, some kids mm. like to sit different ways. And I think that translate very much into the office environment. And we haven't really thought about that. It was sort of like desk, conference room. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll let, um, I'll let Sonia jump in in just a minute, but just from a culture perspective, the thing that jumps out to me as a culture, you know, person, culture consultant is that you have to make those decisions beforehand, right? You have to decide how are people going to collaborate in, is it in small rooms and big rooms and, you know, big like training areas. And then how are people going to socialize? Like that's a whole nother mm -hmm. different kind of, space planning, right? So, but you have to think about it and, and discuss it and figure it out like in advance. And I'm sure there's also some organizations that want to set aside some, some quiet space for those people who have little kids at home or whatever, who can't actually get that quiet space at home. <laughs> um, it's not the cube anymore, right? It's like an actual, mm -hmm. like a pod or, you know, some kind of mm -hmm. like <laughs> formation where, where people can really sit down and like you know, head down and do their work quietly if that's what they need. Um, well, and one thing that I was just thinking about too that I think will be so interesting is as, you know, we continue to talk about this like whole person experience and organizations are talking about like the 
you know, wellness benefits. Like to, in my mind, um, during the pandemic, I did a lot of yoga, like a lot of yoga and more for like my mental health, I think, than my physical well-being. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I worked from home, so I would just throw out a mat. And I remember joking with people, I was like, man, if I was at work, you know, all of our conference rooms at the time had like glass doors. And I was like, I don't like, it would probably look somewhat awkward. You know, I, I don't think anybody would mind if I took a yoga break, but I don't know if I want to be, you know, like doing download dog or child's pose, like with everyone walking by. And so even to think about those kinds of things, like depending on, or even like diversity and inclusion, I just remember one of my former colleagues saying, you know, he prayed multiple times a day. And before he had an office, he had to like run off to different spaces. And I remember um, when I was a relatively new mom, like the lactation room and, and for my office at the time, yeah. that was a big deal. And so there, so there are all these like interesting things about how do we meet and how big are meetings and how many individual versus, you know, personal spaces. But then you start to have all these other nuances, depending on what you want your organization, your culture to stand for. There are actually some extremely cool things that you could do that you could attract a lot of people where you're saying, hey, we'll need you at the office, you know, for certain things. But we also understand that for you as a person, there's some other things that you were able to build into your day that are really important to you. Can you tell us what those are? So I think that that's also like what we were talking about, that interesting dialogue, because sometimes all of us have seen organizations make big decisions out of the best interest and out of like all the goodness in their hearts, but they're not the right ones because they didn't ask people. And so they went off like, what were their perceptions? What are their ideas? And we're really excited about it only to launch something and we're like, oh, wait a minute. I thought people would be, you know, would enjoy this a lot more than they are. So I think that's why like Colleen, when, when you and I met, I was saying, I just, I think your, your role is so fascinating because it's, I think that those interactions in this space has become just it's always been critical but i think people are uber aware of it now because just of the way that a lot of us have been working over the last year and a half and what have we enjoyed about it what do we maybe want to change and maddie i was giggling because you know my son um but everyone was like yeah. oh i forgot to tell the nanny i'm recording and i'm just waiting for him to like, <laughs> come in and, you know and like start to look and like stick his tongue out at the screen and all that um, he's the cutest but it's it's managing somebody differently um, when you're sharing a home in a workspace with him. So anyways, just so like, I, I love everything that you're sharing and I'm just really looking forward to how things unfold. And one, um, as, as you all know, that are, our more regular listeners, Maddie and I always like to include some data points in our conversation. Yeah, I was being, say, this sounds like yeah. a data point. <laughs> Good moment for that. So like being, being culture experts, being researchers, we always like to bring in, um, you know, another perspective. And like I was saying, we have our own perceptions, but it's always important to ask externally what the opinions are. And so we went out and asked 600 U.S. workers who actually work in an office, what kind of changes there have been in the office layout since it reopened. And actually 70% said there have not been any changes. So that's really interesting. And, and Colleen, I think what a little bit of what you were talking about is, you know, what are some of those like low hanging fruits while organizations, you know, continue to figure out like, is it hybrid? Is it all in like all in the office, all out of the office and how much flexibility do I have there? Sometimes making these kinds of physical changes can be costly. So how do we do it? And it looks like a lot of organizations are still in that like waiting pattern of maybe we need, we know we need to do something but we haven't, you know, quite gone there yet. And then what was interesting in, in the data, and then I'll pause for discussion, is that 35% of those, it was a, you know, select, <laughs> select as many options as apply kind of question. 35% of people both said that office is mostly made up of meeting rooms and quiet spaces. So to me, when I saw those numbers so similar, I thought, okay, maybe there's not as many uniquely quiet spaces. Maybe it's mostly office rooms, you know, or meeting rooms and, and you meet, or if you need to grab one to do work by yourself, like Colleen, I'd love your, your opinion on that too. And then 26% said that most of the areas are for social interactions. And so it's a little bit of that, like um, we're, we're starting to see in the data that maybe some organizations that have made the change are putting that stake in the ground and are saying, yeah. yes, you know, social is more important or meetings more important, but just wanted wanted to call out all that data and take a pause and Colleen I know you were saying that there were some things that really jumped out of out of this for you so would love your take on it sure um 
in terms of social interactions, we're just seeing people want and need more of that. I think people are craving the connection with their colleagues and spaces are a great way to bring people together, especially if you mm -hmm. have a variety of spaces within your floor plan that allow for different types of interactions. I think it's a conversation that we've been having in the industry for quite some time. I think things were headed that way and uh, COVID really expedited that, that whole process and it, it's forcing people into making changes to their physical office in order to attract people to want to be there. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's funny, actually, I was just thinking about that 70% who have not heard their offices have not changed. I would not be surprised if a lot of that 70% are in the, like, whatever the percentage, huge percentage of people thinking about going to another, another job, right? Like the whole great resignation. I would not be surprised if there's a lot of those people. Well, <laughs> like, we see, we've been seeing a lot of sort of paralysis by analysis. That's probably a big chunk of that 70% is what, what do we, what do we do? And here we are paying all of this rent, which is typically the second highest expense after yeah. salaries. Yeah. And we're not using our space. So there's some frustration mm -hmm. from the executive level of, oh, gosh, well, we have to put more money into our space that we're already mm -hmm. paying for that nobody's using. But it's really the way to get people back to some yeah. semblance of group activity in the office. Yeah. We think. Well, and I wonder, like, the psychological impact, because so many people are saying, like, we hope this this pandemic was so difficult. We hope some good comes out of it. And the last thing we want is to go back to exactly the way things were. And even if an organization makes some changes, I wonder how much of a signal or how much, like, if you walk in to a place and nothing has changed, um, if a person, like, if it gives you this feeling of, you know, there could be different policies, there could be different regulations, but it's something like it's the artifacts, it's the things you see, you touch. And if there is, you know, some kind of opportunity and some organizations had amazing office spaces to begin with. So I'm not sure if like, oh, change for the sake of change is necessary, but even to do something just to give people like a, a sense of a new beginning or a sense of a fresh start, because I think most people are so desperately looking for that right now. Like the, the promise of a better a beginning. <laughs> recently yeah. that there needs to be a wow factor when you walk yeah. in the office, it needs to be the kind of space that you walk into that you think, wow, it, it feels good. And part of that is natural light. Um, part of that is yeah. being able to see outside. Um, mm -hmm. And then part of that is something that we talk a lot about in my business. It's mechanical uh, equipment. And mm -hmm. um, that's been one of the sort of repeat concerns that we've seen is uh, people asking now, what sort of filters do you have on your mechanical system? Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that we can do to the physical space that are relatively inexpensive to increase safety when the office is occupied. So, yeah, I mean, you want you want your employees to feel safe coming back into the office, because especially if you're coming back in for mostly social activity or mostly meetings. Mm -hmm with other people, right? That's sort of the whole point. Then you want to know that, you know, there's like safety, new safety protocols in place. And or, you know, if you're going to be basically having to wear a mask all day long, you know, you just want to know in advance that there's like protections there. And then hopefully, if you're lucky, you can make the choice about coming in or not. Um, but at least you have all that information. And they're not just leaving you to, you know, survive or, or not. <laughs> so, yeah, we've seen most of the commercial landlords have taken proactive steps to upgrade their mechanical filtration because that's been industry recommended since we started talking about COVID being airborne. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's good. But we are seeing some changes within the physical office to separate people. I think mm -hmm. there there was a point where we were doing a lot of spaces with four foot benching where everybody got a little section of a desk. And mm -hmm. that 
has not been an accepted prototype uh, for 20 months now, which means a lot of people have reconfiguring to do or s separation to do just to be able to use the space that they have right now. So. Yeah, I would think all the talk about like hot desking and stuff is just COVID's kind of changed the game for that too, right? Like you don't really want to share a space that a bunch of other people have sat in. It's a way. it's such a fine line though, because the flip side of that is how many days a week do you need to be in the office to get a dedicated space? So if you're only in the office two days a month or three days yeah. a month. Would you rather have your company put the money into uh, employee salaries and benefits rather than than rent to give everybody a dedicated space that isn't being used? So there are ways to do it. And again, it goes back to protocols. Um, we talked on one pr project about having basically a buddy. So instead of just sharing with anybody, you have a you have a, an office that you're sharing with one or two people and it's up to the three of you to coordinate and communicate and work within what you feel safe doing. You know, when are you going to be in the office? Um, and it really just depends. I think we were so hopeful over the summer when we were back to no masks in the office. And then here, here we are back, uh, back to masks yeah. in the office for now, so. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about it being the variably remote workforce because we now know like this could, the, the need to send people home to work from home could happen at any time in the future. Like this is not yeah. like it's over now, we're all back to back to where we were, right? So no matter what your space planning is, like you still have to be able to accommodate for if there's you know some sort of outbreak and you need to send everybody home like we now know that could technically not mess with your business at all you know we know it's possible yeah. but i think all companies have to be prepared for the possibility that that might happen on a fairly regular basis <laughs> actually you know and that you you want to just set your stuff up so that people can yeah. accommodate to you know whatever is needed uh, to keep yeah. their work going no, yeah. well, and that's such an interesting point because I like what I was thinking about, and we're talking like about two different but related things. Is one going back to the office and, and safety, and what Colleen you were saying, like people really being spaced out, and a lot of that because was because of transfer of COVID, and then the other thought is like hopefully once you know COVID is under control, it's really just the dynamic of work without that fear of like a really like contagious disease spreading, and what's the dynamic there? So it's almost like a one-two step. What do we do if we want to be together, but there's still some danger of a pandemic? And then when that is like nearly gone, let's say I don't like fully whatever <laughs> gone <laughs> in some way, shape, or form, what do those interactions look like when we are not really worried about being, you know, catching something by being in close physical proximity to somebody else? So that it's also, and we don't have the timeline. Yeah, so how I mean, do you effectively plan for that? Yeah. COVID really defined personal space, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, we don't see it going back to the way it was anytime soon, because yeah. even now, you know, we, we go to meetings in person for construction, nobody's sitting next to each other anymore. Everybody's got their chairs pushed back from the table. You know, is there a window we can open? It's really sort of yeah. changed um, the amount of space that we take up in a meeting room. And we've been talking about that. You know, you used to fit 25 people in a boardroom. Would you do that again? And, and a big piece of that then is the technology integration. We right. used to design the space and then sort of slap technology and AV on the wall. And it doesn't work like that anymore. We have to really plan from the beginning because the way that rooms are laid out impacts the AV equipment, impacts the power requirements, and it's all tied together. So we're seeing that planning start really early and to be able to have a Zoom meeting with half your employees at home and half your employees at a table, many organizations didn't have the equipment set up to be able to do that in more than one room. So yeah. they don't right. even have, you know, which is part of why people are still working at home because if there's a piece of, a part of people working from home, 
you have to be able to accommodate everybody and let everybody participate in the meeting. So uh, again, it's sort of a moving target for, for what we've been seeing change, but I think a lot of these pieces are here to stay. Yeah. Are you seeing like new, new technology? And I don't mean like internet, but like new equipment for this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. And there's some very inexpensive sort of quick out of the box solutions. You know, audio visual equipment can be very, very expensive to do conference rooms with speakers, but uh, there's a way to do it cost effectively. Um, and there are options out there. It's definitely, there are more manufacturers available than there were just a few years ago. Yeah, I was thinking this is like a growth industry, right? The like AV hardware and, you know, movable screens and speakers and all of that kind of stuff. Exactly. <laughs> but it's all very, it's all very exciting to me. Um, but I do think, I mean, of course, I always think it's down to culture, but, but, the point, well, the other thing I was just thinking about is that what's risen up to the top also is is really this accommodation or potential accommodation of how people are feeling, right? How employees mm -hmm. are feeling. Because back in the day, you know, I think we can safely say that your major corporation didn't give a shit if you were like, you know, not if you felt like working from home, they'd be like, no, you just can't. Yeah, you know? we can't. Um, and now it's way beyond that because if people are dealing with, you know, if people in their family being sick or they have little kids at home or just all of these different things that we've talked about a lot, you know, in this whole podcast. Um, but, you know, people like the just the, the sense of empathy that you have to have as a leader in a company or organization now, I think is just multiplied in, in a yeah. good way. Yes. Um, I love the yeah. human factor of people working from home too. that you see, you know, even the most powerful CEO that you meet with, her kids break into the room and interrupt yeah. that too. <laughs> um, and some of the dog dogs or whatever. Yeah. Or the the cat cat the screen. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I like that piece of it. I mean, if you think about how things have changed in the 20 years since we've been, we've been working, I used to take conference calls in the bathroom with the door shut. Nobody could know that we had kids. So there's yeah. a nice, there's a nice sort of human factor to equalizing staff and executive team, I think. Well, actually just on that, the equalizing piece, um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's um, super, super tiny, <laughs> even shorter than I am. And she's the CEO of her organization. And she has 50 people working for her. And she said, and they've grown a lot in the last two years because they happen mm -hmm. to be a virtual conference company. Um, but she said that that having meetings on Zoom has actually given her sort of gravitas and stature that if people really knew how small she was, <laughs> Like in real life, like that might not have happened. Like it's, you know, everybody has equal access to her, but she also has the ability to just be, you know, equal in this space too um, and show off her, you know, seniority through her knowledge and stuff like that. But it was just a really interesting conversation about that. And I think um, I've had a similar conversation with younger people having access to a speaker in a Zoom meeting mm -hmm. um, when, you know, they like there's always the two or three people who stand in the room to talk to the speaker like after they're done but, but everybody else is kind of shy like let them go first but on zoom you have the ability to send your questions in like no matter who you are even if you're mm -hmm. like the most junior junior person you can send in a question um so there's just some really interesting things like that that have happened you know, I, I love watching the feedback. I mean, we've been doing design presentations via Zoom and via Miro. And uh -huh. all of the staff is chiming in in a live feed. And then they thumbs up each other's comments. Yeah. So from, awesome. a, from a what are people thinking perspective, we get mm -hmm. way better feedback virtually than we ever did uh, in, in an in-person meeting, again, where people were uh, afraid to speak up. 
Yeah. Well, and I, I wanted to loop this and I was actually reworking the data a little bit because I was thinking based on our conversation, um, this was maybe an even more interesting angle for an insight, like what you were saying, like the, the feedback, the brainstorming, the connection and in making these changes. So looping back a little bit, you know, to our beginning and, and saying that a lot of people were saying there haven't been changes, there's some apprehension um, for the individuals where there have been by and far, uh, people think it's for the better. And so I think that, that was, that's a really great sign for, for organizations that are saying, this is going to be a big investment. What do we do? Now we saw 83% of people where there have been changes in the organization say, we think it was for the better. 17% um, of people did say it was you know, for the worse. So two things that probably come to mind is one, you can never please everyone. So <laughs> forget about that. It's never going to be 100% no matter what. <laughs> but then two, what we were saying, even about the social places or how people want to connect, this is where maybe there is that opportunity. And Colleen, I think you were giving a really great example of a great collaboration and finding a way for people to feel safe, giving different input. Of course, my my passion in life is surveys and connecting you know, people through that means. And so I think that that would be another good vehicle to open up ideas and do a temperature check on, on opinions and some changes. But I, I thought that this was really great data because again, by and far organizations that have made changes, they've been welcomed by people. And of course, there's always an opportunity to improve and some ideas for that, but hopefully for, for organizations that are a little nervous to maybe give it a go because of the investment, I think that this data could be um, quite encouraging, I think in many ways. I think employees are tolerant too. They wanna to see that people are trying. So, yeah. and that their voices are That's being it. heard. And, mm -hmm. you know, it is a lot of experimentation because we've never been in this place before. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, really interesting conversation about how both the, the space and the culture impact uh, mm. the floor plan. Yeah, awesome. So look at that. We're totally at time. So <laughs> as usual, the conversation goes way, way fast. Mm -hmm. um, but Colleen, thank you so much for joining us today on Work at Life. This is super great. And um, I really see this as a huge, great opportunity. I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> because yeah, there's just so much scope for for interesting and improvement uh, and and change um, in the the office space scene. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Colleen.